Hello, YouTube. <clears throat> my wife uh, pointed out that I clear my throat at the beginning of all my videos, so I'm trying to not do that and save people's uh, headphones. Sorry about that. Today we're going to look at the Mauser, uh, Mauser 98, Car 98, whatever you want to call it. Um, Bolt. Uh, the question is about, all about bolts right now because I don't have enough room on the bench to pull up uh, whole rifles. So someone suggested, why don't we just look at the bolts? Because that's really the uh, the most tricky part as a general rule. Um, until we get into semi-automatics and the fire control systems anyway. So for bolt actions, the bolt really is most of the gun. So um, I'm going to warn you up front, there isn't, to my knowledge, an easy way to do this. Um, it requires some degree of strength and and leverage, and uh, I, I don't know any way around it. So I would like people to comment if they know um, at the difficult parts of this. If you if you know some tips, you know, please share, and uh, I'll pass them on in, in future videos. So the most important part is uh, when you take the bolt out, make sure you put the safety on first. So that's the vertical position is uh, safe. And um, if I can demonstrate any of this while I have, see, I do have <laughs> the rest of the gun. So I can, <clears throat> So if we put the thing together and we pull the trigger, you know, no bueno because safety's on. We can flick it to the left or the right, and um, it's going to fire. So cock it again, and uh, tricky pit is middle up is safe. So that's kind of key because uh, even with pretty good hand strength, it's pretty impossible to manipulate that after the fact. So we're going to take it out. Um, if you didn't know how to take it out, by the way, this little lever on the side, you just pull that to the side and the bolt comes out. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, coughed anyway. So now we have our bolt. And um, the first thing we want to do is separate uh, the working bits from the main body of the bolt. Um, I've heard this called the, the bolt head, the bolt, uh, I, I don't know. I don't speak German to know its official name, so not terribly important. But the key is that if we didn't pull it out in the safe position, nothing else is, that we're about to do actually works. So um, this is the retention mechanism. It's the only thing holding it together right now. And you can push that in and uh, start to turn it. It does snap into place. So on each rotation around, you know, you'll have to make sure that it's you know, far enough pushed in to get it. But after that, you know, first full rotation, it's just going to spin right off. So I'm going to put it back on. And the same is true for getting it back on. When it screws on, it's going to stop automatically. It can't go any further. Even if I push this in, there's a distinct shape, shape change there. And that's going to bottom out right on the handle. So it's really... Not a lot of rocket science. So we just push that in and start to unscrew it. And now we have our two main assemblies apart. Um, this is this is one that is not technically part of, of field stripping. Even if you're going to do bolt maintenance, uh, the extractor, because it's um, kind of a pain in the butt to take on and off, and also because it's really not necessary to take it off to clean it it moves around enough that you can get under it pretty well uh, but if you if you have a burning desire to, to take it off and if you own a Mosin or excuse me a Mauser you probably do um, here's the way uh, I like to I like to do it um, essentially the challenge is that there's a track and the extractor does have a, a tongue that's going into that groove and there's no easy way out on the left side or the right side of that. Um, and so since we want to do this um, in a position that's going to involve the least amount of force for the least amount of time, 
I recommend bringing it all the way, uh, if you're holding the bolt still, all the way around uh, clockwise. Um, basically aligning up with, with, you know, as close as you can to those holes. So you're going to bottom it out on that side. And now what you're going to do is squeeze this part. This is basically a lever. When you squeeze here with all your might, this front part is going to lift up. So hopefully there's enough light to see that. So if, uh, if we get a good enough squeeze with as many fingers as we can, we will actually lift the extractor far enough up that it, it can come all the way out of its groove. And when it's all the way out of its groove, it'll actually be able to rotate the next little bit. So I'm gonna try and grab this with all my fingers here. There we go. Urgh. Just get it started, because once you just get it started out of the groove, then you'll be able to slide it. So now you can see that whole uh, piece there and everything about how it's shaped and you can see too much of my there's a lot of grease on this and that's a bad thing that's one of the reasons I'm doing this is to actually fix that I needed to quickly store it and it had uh, rust on it when I got it and so I just put a ton of grease on it which is not the right way to do anything <clears throat> but anyway the point is we've we've pushed that down now the other thing you can do is uh, use the side of a table or, or whatever anything that you can do to get enough force on that to bend it down if you absolutely have to you can also uh, get in there with a screwdriver and just ever so slightly pry it up but you're going to be marring things up when you do that so if at all possible that that's really the way to go is to use the pressing down on this side to make that side pop up once it's at this position and, and you've cleared the whole track you just have to push it straight up and off the bolt um, <clears throat> and so Usually, if you can get a thumb behind it, it'll pop up. Now, that still took, again, a pretty good amount of force. Now, when it comes to the ring, uh, the ring will expand a little bit, uh, but not enough for you to actually get it off. If you do take it off, you're probably going to end up deforming it or even snapping it. So before you go taking this piece off, there's really no reason to unless you've got rust in there that you have to go after. A drop of oil in there is the maximum you would ever have to do for maintenance. Um, there's really not a whole lot of reason to so if you're going to go there buy another one first buy a replacement because uh, if you bust it you're going to be unhappy and as you can see it is one of the uh, the marked pieces so there's the uh, the eagle so keeping your original is kind of a nice thing if you can <clears throat> and uh, that's it for the bolt itself um, it is a bear to clean because of that uh, fact that you have to you can't go you know, it doesn't separate anywhere else so you've got to go all in from this end and flush out any crap that gets in there and uh, it's it's a it's a hell of a piece of machining uh, but at the end of the day there's really not a whole lot you can do to to get in there other than long q-tips and uh, spray cleansers that you can flush stuff out whatever you can do to get it clean that's great um, and then, of course, e equally important is getting a layer of, uh, of, of, of oil or grease back on there to keep it safe long term. Now, here's where <clears throat> there's just no, no good way other than um, a lot of raw hand strength. And, I, and uh, that's an unfortunate reality. Um, the next piece that's going to come off is this little end piece here. And the way it's held on is this uh, the round pin, the actual firing pin all the way through the middle. Uh, it's not perfectly round as it passes through here. It actually has flat sides with grooves in it. And so basically, uh, there's a little tongue and groove system going on. If you can rotate this piece 90 degrees in either direction, that will no longer have it aligned with the grooves, and then it will come off. Now, this spring is under a massive amount of tension. Um, and so basically what we have to do here is push down on the whole piece now if you have um, something that's the, the right size that will accept this in so you can push down on these shoulders that's fantastic if you don't you got to be careful because essentially you're pushing down straight on you know obviously the thinnest weakest piece the firing pin itself the part that's most likely to break if things go wrong and it slides off to the side you're just going to end up bent all sorts of problems but if you have no alternative um, a wooden block 
uh, rubber block, anything that's not metal, um, so that it's going to have at least some give. And basically what we're doing here is we're going to set this up and we are just going to push down real damn hard. Okay. So um, I'm trying to show you how far that goes off. Uh, and because of the camera angle here, that's kind of impossible. So basically it has to go far enough down essentially that the bottom um, the bottom of the piece that we're trying to remove clears the rest of the body so that you can rotate it. I'm not going to be able to get it on film particularly well. Holding a thumb over this is, is, is a good way to get some extra leverage, but that, you know, you can't have it too far out to the side, you know, angle wise, you're just pushing, you know, off to the side. So try and get a good grip on the whole thing as much as you can. Um, well, this is a pretty good you know finger over however you can do it thumb over at this angle and uh, and then actually do it I'm gonna try and push down with my left hand so I'm a little more nimble with my right hand and then I rotated it 90 degrees and off it comes and now you get really got to hold on to this because that spring expands way way up there so when this was on uh, show without the spring you can see what's going on that's this spring was compressed into uh, this much space so literally this spring is twice as long as it was on, on under tension that is and this is a hefty spring I mean it's a, you know I don't know this is 1945 uh, 2015 2016 you know that's freaking old um, <clears throat> So uh, hang on to the top is the message. Now what, what we did there is when we push down uh, on this, compressing that spring all the way to pretty close to two, two thirds, you know, an entire extra third of that is being taken up here. You know, that, that full inch makes a big difference. We've now got this entire spring nearly to the point where it's coil bound because we've pushed it down so far. So that's why there's so much force involved here. And when we got it there, this piece, which, you know, seems almost immobile, it really doesn't turn. It's not screwing on or off. It rotates. And as soon as it hits at 90 degrees, then you can see that these grooves and the inside, uh, the, I'm sorry, the sides of it are flat and the rounded sides have the grooves. And so there's grooves in there that, that made up with that. So that means it can, it can go on only in that position or 180 degrees off. And then in any other position, it's locked solid because now those grooves have engaged the grooves inside this piece. So that's uh, what we what we just overcame to turn it there. And again, if you had just let go of it and the spring at this point, this would launch, you know, 50 miles. I don't know, a million miles, two billion. Point is that it's a it's a hefty piece and the spring is just rough. Now, the uh, the safety, um, the safety. If you if you notice, uh, there's a little edge on the 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 bolt head, cocking piece, whatever you want to call this, uh, over on this side, and how uh, the safety goes around it. That means if the safety's over here, it actually has clearance to come out. If you're here, then it's locked in by that rim and its corresponding groove. But over here, it's clear. And so that piece comes out like that. Um, the last bit here uh, is pretty unnecessary and it's also kind of a pain in the butt to do. I don't even remember uh, if there is a good way to get it on or off. Uh, essentially, um, the, the, the little uh, piece that we had to press to first start unscrewing it, um, it holds itself in place because it rides up and down in this little channel and that's all you normally push it in but if it is all the way pushed in then it can also be rotated and uh, if you rotate it I'm trying to do, hold this at the same time um, if we rotate it all the way inside then it's going to clear the body and, and allow it to come out and uh, got us again a substantial spring which 
my screwdriver is actually too fat to reach it. Sorry about that. Ah, there we go. Come on, you. Oh, and look at that. <laughs> I haven't... Obviously, I've never had this one out before because that's the dried cosmoline. Nasty. So, hopefully, whoever had this in uh, 1945 didn't have hepatitis. And uh, I'm going to clean this up as I go. And a sharp spring, so I just shoved it through the cloth and you know, run it around the whole length of the spring and knock that off. Brush this crusty, nasty cosmoline off and get in there with a Q-tip. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to die of some ancient disease now. So, um, I need to get some canned air, get the compressor going, knock that out a little bit better, uh, get that hole cleaned up properly, but that's okay. Good enough for, uh, good enough for today. Um, so let's, uh, let's look a little bit about how it works, maybe, why this is, the, why the safety does anything. Um, so if we put that safety back on, and again, and the part that's cut out is the side that it, it starts on, the mechanism that actually makes the safety uh, do or not do, as it were, is, um, is, is this, this concept here. So if the, <clears throat> you know, I said something earlier that's actually not true, and I apologize for that. If this piece is up, then that that's safe because the this, which is you know, attached to the entire firing pin, so you know, this is this is our this is our gun. If it's um, if we look, I can't show you all these things at the same time. <coughs> uh, when I move this safety up then that little crescent is, is intruding into the, into the cylinder there and likewise here. When it's in this position, the cylinder can go all the way forward and since it's attached to the firing pin, that means that that's the only way that the firing pin can come forward. So if you have this flopped over to the right, that's also technically a safe position. Gun no go bang in this position or this position, but it will go bang in this position. And there's a reason for that, and I'm embarrassed as heck, but I can't remember what it was, what the second position was for. It does have some actual function uh, in the world, and it has completely left my memory, so I apologize. Now, in terms of uh, how this is working, um, this is the sear engagement surface right here, is the underside of this piece. So remember, this is holding the whole firing pin. So if this can't go forward, the firing pin can't go forward. Um, and uh, that's the long and short of it. This is, you know, wherever this piece is, that, that's controlling where, where the firing pin is. And the spring, remember, is, is pushing on this part of the whole thing, but not back here. This, the spring is being held between this piece and the front of the firing pin. So this piece isn't actually, you know, under under spring tension. It's just an extension of the rest of it. The spring is just pushing this part forward really, really hard. So as soon as anything is free, this whole piece will want to come forward with it. <clears throat> so in this position, uh, we're in fire. And um, when the you pull the trigger, Normally, the, 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 the sear is up here blocking this from coming forward. When you pull the trigger, you're pulling the sear down and out of the way, which lets that come forward. So all of that massive spring tension is just held up because the trigger's got a piece that's sticking up here in the way. You're pulling the trigger, and uh, essentially what's happening is, uh, I'll use this as my sear, is... Lots of spring tension. My finger is simulating the spring. I pull something down off of here, and now it can go forward and go bang. And that's the whole thing. And so, um, 
And of course, in safe, you know, if I pull the trigger out from under there, it doesn't matter because the safety's little half moon is preventing this from going forward. I really wish I could remember what the other position was for. I'm so sorry, folks. But, ah, uh, I guess I'm just getting old. Geezing. So, wipe some of this ancient grease off. I really need to put better grease and a lot of, a, uh, a lot more better distribution of grease on this now um, my particular uh, spring is got one end that's a flattened spring um, so that last coil is 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 flat and against you know it's, it's basically filed down and and a short coil but the bottom end is a uh, is a free end so that that tells you which way is up if you put it like this there'd be a tendency for this extra leg to get caught on the outside and start to slip past and gum this up. So whenever you have a spring where one end is just a free cut coil, but the other end is, is a flattened one, the flattened one is designed to be pushing up against a similar flat surface. So that's how you can kind of tell with springs which way the designer meant them to go in if they can go in in more than one way. So putting this back in is the same process. We're just going to put it in and then tuck something in there to start it rotating and get it back into its little channel there and he's good to go. Um, we're gonna put our safety back in and again because the you know cutout side is here that's where the, the, the holding bit, the bit you hold on to goes in on that side and um, I'm gonna put our spring back on and the spring has the flattened coils on both sides because both ends are actually pushing up against something that's you know in a contained area, not a, a blind hole like the uh, the other one is. So this one has to have a proper coil spring on both sides. And again, now <clears throat> um, let me show you without the spring. Reassembly. Now this piece as well uh, rotates. Um, with this and that's to keep these guys from getting out of rotation with each other um, when you know you, you don't want one to move without the other this is designed only to be going in and out in normal you know function these pieces rotate together uh, or not at all as is a better way to think about it so um, for reassembly what we have to do is compress that spring all the way down so that we can get this and again it's going to go in 90 degrees off from where we want it and then we want to rotate it now if we rotate it there it's going to come all the way back out and that's really not where we want it um that's the worst one because now we've got to put a ton of force on it so really, as long as the safety is there, then that that's actually okay. We just don't want you don't want to put it in the fire position um, and let it go all the way forward because then you've got to compress it again and, and try and get the safety flipped up and all that stuff and, and you just hurt yourself. So uh, again, my recommendation is we're going to do this with the safety in the safe or upright position. Man, I really gotta get my camera lined up better. Someday I will have enough money for a better camera and larger angles and better zoom and a second angle and all that good stuff. But you know, channel's new. Bear with me. So, um, we know that we have to pay attention to the orientation of the flat area because this one is only going to receive the flat side and, and one, one, or one angle of the dangle. And, uh, and of course you can't see this way up top, but I am pushing it down. And then I'm going to come in with this piece, and as I push it way down, I'm going to push this, put this on, but not, not put it on this way because it's not going to go on. It has to go on 90 degrees off of where I want it, and then rotate once I can actually see the top or the back of the firing pin, you know, pop out of here. It can't go too far on either. Um, it, it's it's limited in how far it'll go. So here we go. We're going to push this on. rotate it and I still have all my fingers and I got it back on <clears throat> and uh, yay uh, so we're we're back where we started with that now let's get our uh, extractor back on we're gonna get it on pretty much the same way we took it off except that these guys uh, there this will have sp uh, sprung open some and that uh, 
if you can see the shape of this thing, I don't know why my lighting is so bad today, but uh, if you can see that there's a little wings on either side of this piece, they go into the, the corresponding grooves on the extractor itself. Which means that uh, maybe uh, you'll be able to squeeze that tight enough to get it started, but uh, yeah, maybe not. Now in this case, I was able to just barely get it started, which is all you need. But if you have to, you can just um, just hold these uh, closed with a, with a pair of pliers here, and, and that'll make it you know, easier. Uh, I need to redo the padding on my pliers. Obviously, it's completely come off. Got to bust out the Plasti Dip again. But uh, once you get the, that ring compressed, uh, it's easy to get this guy started. And that's really all you're doing. You're, you're going to bottom out really quickly on the bolt itself with that ledge. And now we have the exact you know opposite problem of where we started. We have to squeeze this piece in to get that far enough over. Now we have a little more leverage this time because we could technically use our finger, but frankly my extractor is sharp as, as all dickens and so I really don't want to get my finger up there if I don't have to. So I'm going to just try and give it a mighty squeeze um, from right here to just get it going. Ah, ah. Now um, I've got it started on the, now I'm at least on the outside of the bolt. Now I'm not down far enough yet. I want to be down far enough that I'm going to line up with the, uh, with the groove here. So I, I still got to keep going a little bit, but of course I can just push it on anything to get it down far enough. And once I'm there, it's going to be a little stiff to rotate, but you can rotate it and it will pop right into its little groove. Now, once it's in its little groove, it should free float around just fine. Now, um, the one thing I forgot to do while I had that all out was put the drop of oil on that I was supposed to do in the first place. Pretty much the only excuse for doing all that. So once again, I'm going to squeeze as much as I can here and get my rotation. Come over to the side, push up and out, and now put a couple drops of whatever this is that's semi-coagulated on me. Oh dear. Uh, I guess it's colder in this room than I thought it was. Well, anyway. It's not the lightest weight oil in the world, obviously, but it's light enough. So I'm just going to put a drop in there and spin it around. Uh, it'll distribute itself pretty, pretty readily on its own in there. Um, and then back to... Uh, assembly same concept I'm just squeezing it with my fingers this time it worked giving it the big squeeze to get it over the edge push down a little bit more rotate till it pops into place oh yeah lack of butter baby okay and then of course last but not least is uh screwing it back on now, uh, you'll notice that it screws on pretty liberally, and actually, because of the way these are beveled, that you can really just twist it past those. Um, the only place you really have to push up on it is just to get it started that, that first little bit. And, uh, and that's, that's really it. So it's going to bottom out there, and now when you go to put it back in the gun, remember to align the extractor with the with the lug so it can slide in. If it if it's halfway off, then the extractor is going to get in the way of the the rest of it. And let's see if I can uh, haul my whole. Oh oh uh oh, we've got a visitor, Kitty. I love you too, sweetie. But oh ow, hey, that's claws. All right, I'm being attacked by a cat. Oh. All right, down you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. A little uh, Wild Kingdom interlude. Wow, there is way too much grease on this thing. So uh, a little bit more about the sear concept that we were talking about. Um, you can see here the trigger. When I pull the trigger, it's going to lever down this piece. So there's a, a spring here pushing on, pushing down here, which makes this side get pushed up 
And really, all that's going on with the trigger is it's mechanically attached in the middle to basically lever against the receiver itself and, and therefore apply a force here. So you have a spring on, on, here we go. Can we see all of these things at once? This is the pivot point of the whole thing. And there's a spring that, that's pushing away. And if I push down on this side, then that, you know, push up on this side, this side comes down. So another way to do that is to just, with the trigger, push up there. So the trigger is really not a whole lot of rocket science there. And so what happens is um, the piece that uh, causes us all our heartache, that rides in this little channel and it, it, it just gets blocked by the trigger. The trigger cannot come because that piece is sticking up. When you, when you excuse me, the, the bolt can't come, for, or the, the cocking piece can't come. For, I can't get any of the names of anything right today. It's been a long day, guys. Sorry. You know what, let's do it the fun way. Let's, re, let's actually disassemble this guy again. You know, sometimes learning is fun. Other times, involves getting stabbed in the eye by an ancient German piece of equipment. So I'm going to take this whole thing down again just to show you that one exciting piece and to show you that I can do it more than once. <laughs> so uh, this piece is going to have the whole firing pin attached to it here. So firing pins are going to be in there, you know, waiting to, uh, to go forward. And this guy rides in this track, right? Oops, now I've rotated my whole thing. There we go. So firing pin attached to it and this little track here. And when it right comes forward, it's stuck. This, this little piece that rides in the track is the limiting factor to the whole thing. So it wants to come forward because that spring is pushing really hard to make this guy pop forward. But until the trigger is pulled and this sear is dropped out of the way it can't so if i push this here simulate the spring with a little finger action when i pull the trigger there it goes bang and when you cock it the whole point of cocking it is just to move it past that again and uh and it'll pop back up now as it is a bolt action gun um there's no disconnector if you're used to my pistol videos we always talk about the f parts of the fire control system that you're going to have uh, a trigger and a sear and then either a striker or a, or a hammer and in this case it's essentially like a striker fired system <clears throat> the whole big firing pin i mean obviously there's no hammer the whole firing pin is essentially the striker and so the trigger moves the sear out of the way striker can come forward but the issue is it doesn't need a disconnector because you have to take your hand off your finger off the trigger to cock it. Now what if you didn't? What if somehow you held the trigger back and then somebody else stood next to you and was going to manipulate the bolt for you? So they open it, they you know, pull it back, extract around, round goes out, they bring it forward. I'm going to get rid of uh, the firing pin for this demonstration. And um, now they go to return the bolt. The bolt's going to go in, it's going to pick up a round, it's going to chamber the round, and, and right about here, nothing is uh, in the way anymore. This piece is going to still be forward. So what does that look like? Well, what it looks like is um, the firing pin still going to be protruding. So you have this sudden risk of uh, if they slam that bolt hard enough, then the gun would actually go off. So let me put it back together and show you guys that little aspect. Uh, bear with me, because once again, I've got to play Mr. 200 pound gorilla here. Okay. So I'm gonna actually set this with the safety off, just like I told you is an obnoxiously uh, tricky. Slide him back in and screw him on. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. That's the other reason to uh, not do this with the uh, with this in the down position is because.
because physics wise that's going to cause us some problems so let me go and put this back into the safe position all right putting it back in the safe position means we can screw it all the way back on and we're good to go so um now we're gonna basically simulate the the fired position so that is uh, whoa. Um, uh, safety down and technically technically speaking my bolt should be actually rotated at this point I'm not sure I'm going to be able to actually do all of that because of the various obnoxious forces involved. Hmm. Hold that thought. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I just did the stupid thing. Um, and the stupid thing consists of actually getting it all the way into the fired position. Um but not when I really wanted to. Hang on, I gotta think this one through. Uh, if I put it there, it's not all the way fired because the bolt is not in the in battery position. So this is actually only in the half fired mood. Where is that? All right, so if you do this by accident, like I have done, you have to recover from it and it's, um, I don't think there's a real good easy way to do that. And uh, the reason is, is well, actually, can you use the gun to do it? Hold that thought testing theory real quick. Yes, okay, there is one easy way to deal with it. So, um, in order to show you what I just did, since I, I monkeyed myself up and let it go into the fired position when I really didn't mean to, uh, one of the things that you can do to easily correct it rather than manhandling it is to actually put it in the gun and um, and cock it and now you can get it back into the safe position um, but importantly what I really wanted to show you was the fired position while it was out of the gun am I going to be able to do that? this is one of those days where I can't think myself through anything so, all right, so let's let's back off again. Put it in safe, take the bolt out, and basically, um, I'm just hesitant to do this because I know how hard it's gonna be to undo this if I do it, but the point is that uh, if we were allowed this is the the actual locked up position so here is is where we are chambering around here is where it, it's going to go and if the trigger wasn't there to hold this piece back and the safety wasn't on then what would end up happening is that it would be able to come all the way forward essentially simulate the same thing that would happen if it, if it were to fire and i think that I may be able to pull back on that sear just long enough. Yes, there we go. So what I just did is um, I got it into the fire position and get my brain wrapped around which way I'm trying to turn it. There we go. That is the fully fired position. And the importance of the fully fired position is that we're now thinking about the gun like this and uh, firing pin is permanently out when that when that that it's not like there's any you know bounce back or it's not inertial in any way when this gun fires that firing pin simply is suddenly out of the chamber so if you were to have the trigger down and you slammed around home with this you would be slamming that round home with the firing pin protruding and all nine bazillion pounds of force behind that spring, I assure you that uh, I, don't, I don't know if I ever would have the strength to get that back in. Maybe that's, you know, it's going to pop the primer. There, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. So 
Again, though, it's kind of impossible to do without the assistance of a friend and some great difficulty. So essentially, it's not unsafe for the gun not to have a disconnector. It just doesn't need one. But really, the point of the disconnector is to deal with what happens if instead of a friend to operate it, you put a bunch of other things in the gun so that the gun semi-automatically chambers the next round for you. And that's why the disconnector is important as well, is it, it's what causes all of that other mechanism to um, to let go. Now, as you can see, once it's in this position that I've got it in, you know, there, there's no, I don't think, any way to use the gun itself to recover from it. We actually have to, uh, to go old school and pull that all the way back so I can get it rotated around again. And this is probably just going to involve me uh, stabbing myself once or twice. Ah. Well, maybe not. Well, I'm not slow, but she's old. So now I should be able to use my... Uh, oh, I did, did it exactly upside down. Really, I, I have seen a gun before, you know, in movies. Um, let's see if I can't keep rotating this to where I actually need it to be. Hmm. And ba. All right. Slowly but surely, we're working it back to a position where I can actually uh, use the firearm itself to get everybody reassembled properly. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Oh no! I, I managed to move off again. Where am I trying to go with that? I need to get this piece moved to about R. So, in case you're wondering about the whole, this is why you disassemble it in the uh, safety on position, this is why, because this is just really hard to manipulate otherwise. Oh, oh wow, that's a streak of pure luck. I managed to actually um, get it far enough back to move the safety at the same time, and it flopped into the right position for me. A little bit of dumb luck eventually do enough dumb things eventually you'll get lucky at one of them so now we're back in the right position for assembly which is uh in the cocked position with the safety on and everything actually lined up the way it's supposed to be and so once again toss the receiver up so we can all see lever out to get it started gun comes in down pull the trigger and nothing happens oh gosh safety's on of course nothing happens I really wish I could remember, other than for takedown purposes, if that's the only thing is this right hand is for takedown, and I guess that is all of it. So anyway, safety off, and bang. And that is the Mauser 98 bolt system. Ain't nothing else to it. That's the whole thing. So, hope that was uh, entertaining and educational. And did you see what I just did? Again, again, I took it apart without having the damn safety on. And once it's this far apart, you can't adjust the safety. You have to actually pull this out uh, another eight, the full eighth of an inch. Oh, do as I say, not as I do, for the love of God. Let's remember to align the extractor up with the uh, lugs to get it back in. And uh, now... This time, I'm going to remember to put the safety on, and then take it out. All right. There we go. Anyway, that's all. Have fun. Uh, let me know what you guys want to see next. I've got um, a lot of different guns. I've got some lever action stuff. Um, uh, if there's other semi-automatic pistols you want to see um, with, with the detailed stuff, uh, I mean, the fire control systems on rifles like this are trivial, but if you wanted to see something a little more interesting, maybe a, an SKS, I could probably get enough of the SKS on, on film to pull that off. Um, oh, let me, a word about lubrication. Sorry, I almost forgot. I was pimping this in another video. Um, don't go crazy when it comes to grease. First of all, most guns don't use grease. Uh, 
your modern pistols, they, there's no there's nowhere on a modern pistol that you put grease. They're designed to have very lightweight oils, and that's it, and only in very specific places. Most of them have finishes that protect them against the elements more than uh, your oil actually does. Um, but in old in, in bolt action guns and lever guns, basically anything old school is designed for grease, and the uh, most modern weapon you know, that is common that you might have your hands on that's still technically designed for grease in parts of it would be an AK. And that's generally only on the rails and the, and the bolt itself, the fire control system, still oil. But grease, when it comes to grease, everybody uses way too much and on places where it wasn't designed to be used. So the right way to use grease is first of all to get the right kind of grease. A lot of people use the white lithium and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, um, it's just not my favorite. This is my favorite. It's uh, it's basically what the military used back in the um, M1, M14, uh, M1 carbine. All those rifles. That that's what they were designed uh, to be lubed with. It's even got a military, technically, military part number. But the key word in Greece is that you don't use a lot, and. Uh, that's a real common mistake. People put grease on stuff like the way you would, you would pack bearings on a car or, or, or boots, you know, things that are full of grease or covered in grease. And that's just not the way it's used in firearms. The design, and this company even turned it into their little logo, if you can read under the uh, lot number, it says, it's the film. Film is the key word. If I want to put grease on something, I'm going to use my, my grubby old finger. Um, I put grease on it and I spread it around and I say, oh, look, I've got, I've done a good job. I can, I can see that I've moved my grease everywhere and this bolt is now well lubed at the end of the area. I'm not talking about the back where I didn't put any, I'm just talking about what you can see here. So the issue is that it's not, that is terribly lubricated and it's not going to actually move smoothly. It's actually going to impede movement to a degree and it's certainly going to attract fouling like nobody's business and the idea is that especially the fact that i can still see some opaque areas now the lighting might make this hard hello kitty um but the idea with grease is that you know you have the right amount first of all when you can't see it if you still see the grayish whitish color you know everywhere where you can see it that's too much by definition, you should never be able to see the uh, the grease that's on there. You should only ever know that it's greased by by touch. So every, if the fact that I drag my finger through it and I can see the the trail left by my fingerprints, too much grease. So I'm gonna use my fingers here, which is not the best mechanism because they have all of their own flavor of oils. Yes, kitty, I love you. You want to say hi to the people again? No, okay. Um, there's a cat like two inches from view here, guys. So, uh, I'm spreading this around. It's on my fingers. It's on the metal. And that's not the best way to spread it around. What I like to use is a, uh, um, uh, I think they call them acid brushes. They're disposable paint brushes. You can get them in you know, packages of a hundred from Brownells or Midway. Uh, basically they're just little cheap paint brushes that are designed to be used once and then tossed and that's what you do I take the paintbrush dab it in the grease the next thing I tend to do I wish I had I don't, I don't know where my pile went or I would actually show you this but the concept is is I'll tend to uh, take the paint my finger is going to simulate a paintbrush right now I'm going to tap it into the grease and I just rub it in on the cover over and over and over and then I coat the, this is with the paint, right? I, I coat the brush bristles by rubbing them in. And that little bit of grease that's on the cover right now, that's like too much grease for 10 weapons. That's really how far it goes. A little goes a really long way. So I get a real thin film of it on the brush so I don't have a lot to begin with. And as I spread it around, I never go back to the grease. That one brush is going to be enough to do every last part of this gun that needs grease in any way because again it's not the grease it's the film it's the film that the grease leaves behind which is of course grease but the point is it's that thin ultra thin layer that you can't see you're, you're shooting for that whole one molecule thick layer 
because that's the whole point of it is you're reducing friction between the two surfaces. And so having 50, you know, having a thousandth of an inch of grease between two surfaces doesn't help. They're surfaces that are touching each other. They're going to have to push away that grease. You're really looking for, you know, just a one atom thick kind of layer is the concept. You don't want a lot of this stuff. Um, it's also, you know, a, as a protectant, yeah, it goes everywhere. But again, it, don't, it doesn't have to have a lot to protect it. The thicker you lay it on isn't, isn't buying you anything. So now, you know, now that I've been rubbing on it and it doesn't look like there's any visible grease, I move my finger over it. I don't leave tracks, but I can tell on my finger that my fingers are slimy. So I know there's something there. That's the right amount of grease. And that, that's just, uh, people think that you just, you know, squeeze the bottle on and it, like toothpaste and, and you're great. Um, it really, it really does the opposite of what you want in the world of firearms. So, uh, if that's one thing you can remember about lubrication, then you'll, you'll go far. I actually at the shop, um, it's just been a weird month. I, I don't know. It's been extra busy lately, which is, is kind of, it's great for business, but I'm not really sure. I guess the beginning of the cooler weather brings more people to indoor sports and it's an indoor range. So uh, I've had a lot of repair jobs where people were unhappy with how their guns were working. They weren't broken. There was not like bits falling out and they fired most of the time, but I had um, a lot that just said occasionally it won't fire. So I, I, one out of 10 rounds, no go bang. Uh, you know, one guy even dropped it off saying one out of 100. Yeah, believe me, testing that's not a lot of fun. Um, but on all of them where they're having a problem, you know, every magazine or every other magazine. Um, and I actually had one that was so bad that it, it just was light strikes every time. It almost never actually went bang. The whole problem on all of these was the same thing, too much lubrication. Um, some of them had used grease on modern pistols, which just is a disaster because, um, most modern pistols, almost all modern striker fired pistols, the, the striker chamber is designed to be run completely dry, no lubrication whatsoever. It actually needs to be dry in order to exhaust, uh, excess brass bits, which tend to accumulate inside the small chamber. So all of them had put at least oil in there one had like two different types of oil both thicker than you should ever put on a gun and another had grease and they, they were what was the whole problem the person was trying to to do things right and make their gun as well lubricated as they could imagine and their their you know their uh, gut response was lots of grease must be good and it's just not the answer more lubrication is not a a good thing the right amount of lubrication that's a good thing so with that final thought um hope you had fun enjoy and leave some comments on what you guys want to see next if i can get my hands on it i'll demo it take care have fun be safe